Cut the Check podcast brought to you by Craft Farmer, bringing you weekly motivation, unmatched cultivation tech, and telling you some badass war stories along the way. We're back. Long waited. Everybody's been sending messages wondering where the podcast is. Um, we needed a slight little break. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of traveling, but we're back with a vengeance. We have an amazing guest today, close friend of mine. Michael, straight from Oklahoma. Yes, yes. Green Bonnet Farms. Green Bonnet Farms. And you've had just an incredible history in this industry. Like, you've done some just absolute amazing things. You've seen things that a lot of us haven't got to see or experience around this industry. And it's been... A hell of a ride for you and like where you are now and, and what you've taught yourself to do and I don't even know where to start with all this like it's it's so incredible to be honest well I uh, appreciate for being here step one but um, yeah I've, I've just always focused on uh, trying to find the next best thing uh, learning from others uh, taking other people's experiences and trying to apply them to my own uh, aspects of what we were doing and um, figuring out how to take someone's experience and, and actually use it to help yourself and someone else, kind of how I've always thought to do things. Um, and I mean, right now you have a, a full-blown licensed mixed light operation in Oklahoma. How, how many square feet is that gutter connect you have? So the whole facility is about 34,000 square feet, uh, about 28,000 of actual cultivation, and then the other 6,000 is utility and dry rooms and processing rooms and storage. Um, yeah, it's a big, big facility. So all on concrete, full automation, everything's computer controlled, can control it right here from my phone. Um, it's a work of art, I think. And fully developed from ground up, raw land. Yes, we bought raw land, um, didn't have power, didn't have water, nothing. Now we have prime power, redundant transformers, you know, giant generator backup system, um, gas. We got uh, propane, I think 5,000 gallons of on-site propane, diesel for the generators, um, CO2, giant CO2 tank system, uh, like a four-inch water line main coming in. Ag, it's like an ag line, I think they call it. Uh, everything that I could think of to make sure that we were not going to have a problem, it was thought of, hopefully. We're, we're learning through that now every day. So before we get into that facility and what you're doing now, let's go back to kind of like almost the beginning of this, kind of like where it started for you and mm -hmm. what really immersed you into the cannabis culture and the business. Like what were you doing? What had transpired to really get you into cannabis at the very beginning? Okay. So really it was, I was growing uh, peas, like fucking peas. And I built this little hydro setup in my garage. Um, I was just taking random seeds you'd buy at like Ace Hardware. And um, I had like a little trough and an air pump that would pump water, pump air into a tube and it would shoot the water up. And uh, that I was like amazed by it because I could buy these little seeds and then in a period of time I could have something I could use. So that was my attraction to, to, to it. I was always a builder, someone with my hands wanted to work and do things. So when I learned that like you could grow plants and like it, you took nothing and made something, I was very intrigued. So that was the start of it all. Then obviously I smoked weed when I was a kid and I was like, well, I can probably grow this. I know how to grow peas and shit. So uh, let's try to grow weed. And um, that was the, the, the first attempt. First attempt to grow weed, I built a, like a, I don't know, like a six by eight uh, file cabinet. It was like a big, tall file cabinet. 
And I put a 400 watt light in it, a little hydroponic system in the bottom. That lasted two months before I realized this is not gonna do what I want it to right. do. Um, then I took a little walk-in closet and uh, filled that up with lights, like four 400s or something. Um, that was kind of the start. And then as I kept doing it, I learned more and more and I was more intrigued and I wanted to make it better. And this was a long time ago before there was a lot of this cool technology and things, you know. We didn't even have like air-cooled hoods when I first started. It was just the wings, the bat yeah, wing. The adjusta wings. The adjusta wing. I don't even think they called them adjusta wings <clears throat> back then. They were just like the bat wing. You could flex them if you wanted. But um, yeah, then... That was all being done in a place, let's just say, that's not uh, good to grow cannabis in. So I like every environment we had back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so eventually I was like, I went to my, my mom actually and I said, look, I'm either going to get in trouble or you're going to help me go somewhere where I can do this and not get in trouble. Um, and so she agreed and uh, the first time I left there and moved here, I actually moved right down the street. Literally. Where did you move here from? Texas. Okay. Yeah. I moved from Texas to Santa Rosa. How did you pick Santa Rosa? Like, how did that even come up on your radar? So I had, I had one friend out here that I would call a friend. Um, and he lived in like, um, my Rin County kind of. Okay. Um, and he was like, yeah, he was telling me, he's like, you either got to go to Santa Cruz or you got to go to like, humble santa rosa area and i was like i'm not going all the way up there i need to be close to an airport things like that um but i wanted to be a little con like i wanted to be i didn't want to be in like marin county yeah. or oakland or san francisco and i didn't want to go to santa cruz at the time so uh i looked on a map and i found santa rosa honestly and i was like this is easy it's you know an hour and a half to get to to the city um it's not too far that's how I ended up in Santa Rosa. There was no rhyme or reason besides close to him and close to an airport. And I mean, Santa Rosa is really, really rich with like known for like perfect weather and soil to grow all these amazing different things. When Luther Burbank originally had picked Santa Rosa, he picked Santa Rosa to be his home just based on the weather and the fruit and the vegetables and like all the stuff he could grow. And that's Ooh. how he ended up picking Santa Rosa and, and doing all his grafting and all the stuff that, that he is, um, remembered for, but it was specifically, he traveled all around the United States and he said, Santa Rosa had the best weather <clears throat> and the best ground conditions for cultivating. Huh. Which I'm is pretty a, interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting. Well, the weather is really good. I know that. Um, it's a big, it's a, it's, it's an ag place. The only thing I would say is that, like, if you go inland a little bit more, you get, uh, it's a lot, lot less uh, humidity. It starts getting hot, though. It's, it does start getting hot. Like, we don't um, have really bad humidity here, even through, like, the whole year. Even when it rains, it's not too, too bad, where, as some other places are a lot hot, hotter and drier. So if you hit it, if you, if you had, like, inland a couple hours... Even like winters, you start getting into like over 100 degree days easily in the wintertime and you're like, or summertime and you're 15% humidity. So yeah. it, get, it starts getting gnarly as you go. Yeah, that's how it is. Inland. In, in, I mean, in Oklahoma, you can get a 100 degree day. Yeah. yeah. Very few over 100, but you definitely get the high temperatures. Um, so you're here in Santa Rosa, moved here, you picked this spot. Yep, yeah, picked this spot. Uh, just started. This was like the digital ballast had just come out. Um, the Lum the Lumitech. Um, so I had a little little setup then. I had, I think, started with six six hundreds. I think or four six hundreds in a little room, a little AC in the wall. That was the first time we saw an actual digital ballast. Yeah, yeah. adjustable. That was fucking yeah. game changing. Yeah, they were. Uh, there was a lot of problems with the first ones. I oh, remember yeah. that. I remember like getting ones and then they, it would work for two weeks and then you'd have to call them and then they would, luckily they'd be nice. They'd send you a new one, but there was a lot of problems with them. Um, I just wanted them because they were 
they were light and easy to move and things like that. Um, as you can see, like nowadays, the, the digital ballast is kind of gone. For sure. Yeah. Like, uh, it goes even like if you're just using it, regular lights, you, most of them are normal ballast again. There's not too many companies like making them. You got a few random stuff you've never heard of from overseas, but Gavita just tapped out. They're not going to be doing theirs anymore. Oh. I, I think Phantom might still be making theirs, but, you know, Lux is gone. Yeah. Gavita's no longer making um des like it's it's interesting we're seeing the the shift now yeah um but it's hard too at the same time you know especially like a situation in mixed light where you can really utilize the heat and the way that those lights perform and how they are to your advantage in that growing condition yeah in five years we might not even see any des anymore yeah the no. u.s might ban them or or some shit like that i don't the problem is i don't think they'll ever <clears throat> be able to ban them because every street light you see is a thousand watt light I mean, well everything here has been converted to led here they use leds on the streets yeah. i've never seen i've never seen, california every, doesn't fuck around like yeah because the power situation is bad, bad. Here. so everything is pushing that way i think I read something that said by like 2024, 25, there's a mandate for LED for LED lighting, and yeah. that's going to be interesting. If there's really a mandate and it forces these facilities to switch, there's gonna there's gonna be a big learning curve for these people who are not investing the time and learning how to you grow with the light properly. Yeah, no, there, that'll be a big deal. Um, there's a lot of incentives though. Like I, I met one of the guys from the social club that he was, uh, he's in Colorado and, uh, he got like, he got like, uh, a hundred thousand dollars worth of LEDs basically for free yeah. from filling out some stuff. Like I was like amazed by that. That's actually Michigan's really big on the rebates right now too. The rebates. Yeah. They're like really, really hooking people up and taking care of them. Yeah, I, never, I have never seen or you know that in my personal experience. But when he told me that, I was like, "This is intriguing." He was like, "Yeah, I basically got all the lights for a whole room for free." It's pretty impressive. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so basically, uh, Santa Rosa, and then after Santa Rosa, I went down toward Santa Cruz once again from my friends. Yeah, uh, lived in the mountains of Santa Cruz and. Uh, just started building lots of grows for people, for myself. Um, and I really enjoyed the building aspect more than anything, the design, learning equipment, you know, uh, back to the Dosatron thing. This is 2006. I had Dosatrons, which at that time, I think no one was doing it, especially growers weren't. It was it was right before there was a company that was based in Oakland that came up with like using dosatrons for cannabis. Um, it was called Easy Feed. Was the really? company name? Yeah, and they got they did um, they did a trade show, big trade show, and then something happened. I don't know the the exacts to it, but I'm pretty sure the guy who started the company he got in a lot of trouble like legal trouble so the company went away but he was like the first one to like build like a dosatron skid um i wasn't building skids or anything i was just hooking them all up yeah pvc and you know one time use put it on the wall and it's good to go when it's time to cut it out you just cut it out and take it um but yeah that's then then i started basically that was all indoor for a long time down there and then one day a guy I knew, he basically was like, hey, you got to come and check out this uh, outdoor grow. And I was like, hmm. I was like, I know a little bit about that, but I'm like, really don't know enough. He's like, no, he's like, just trust me. He's like, we do a different way. And that was the first time I ever saw like giant plants, like, you know, 15 feet tall, 12 foot wide. You know, it was probably like, august when i went the first time i saw this oh, and these, so it had to be an epic site oh yeah it was like everybody just everything just started blooming yeah and i'd never seen anything i and <clears throat> knowing so much and about pl the plants and knowing so much about like how things work it really blew my mind because i was like how does this happen um because we're so used to con control 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 where there's a different type of control so once i saw that that really like got my brain like 
twisted. I was like, what the fuck are we doing growing inside when uh, you can do this outside? And so then I really started trying to focus and figure out like, what do these outdoor guys need like help with? Like they had their simple irrigation and stuff, but they really didn't know. They didn't know all the stuff about irrigation. They didn't know about like a lot of them had no clue about dosers. They had fucking buckets everywhere and troughs and totes. So I started going meeting a lot of these guys and I would build in these little outdoor doser setups. And uh they loved it, you know. Like everyone loved it. Uh you could have one doser and just feed your whole field of monsters and it was easy. They don't break. Um super reliable. Yeah. Really, really reliable. Non mechanical. Yeah. Easy in. What goes through, you get this much sucks up, it works. Um, I mean, we would dose stuff that, like, nowadays we've learned not to, but, like, bat guano. Like, just pour bat guano in a five-gallon bucket, put the, the whatever, the little suction line. We would just wrap that in pantyhose a whole bunch. and so then just super filtered. Yeah, and then pour water in it and then dose the bat guano. And then when that bucket becomes slosh again, just pour water again. Like... And it works. Like, you can see it work. Um, like, the plant health changes. Um, where, obviously, you don't want to do that because nowadays it's not the best practice. But um, we tried everything. I mean, I put so much stupid stuff through there um, that nowadays no one would want to put through there. For sure. Um, yeah, and then so then I learned about the outdoor. I was really into that. Um and then I actually took a big break, and I was like, uh, I really wanted to go and like focus on other things, like business type type of stuff. So I got into uh, other industries, did other things, like uh, what? Electronic cigarettes it was at the beginning. Excuse me, before anybody was um, like before the boom of electronic cigarettes, it was still like the old school. I started a. Uh, like an, a liquid company, like an e-liquid company. And we just sold, we manufactured and sold e-liquid um, all over the United States. We had some customers in other places. Like flavors? But, different yeah, flavors flavor, different and flavors stuff. and different nicotine levels. This is at the very beginning. Um, and I did that for a while. Because that was booming in the beginning. Like yeah. when you... Like the, the, the e-cig shops that had the different flavors and they're in the back with their fucking... I mean, if you think about it, like it's pretty fucking nasty. Like what's going on behind the scenes like my buddy jesse owned a store and like they would get five gallon jugs of like this oil vegetable and glycerin flavors yeah. and all this shit and they would make you all these custom formulations and yeah. and all kinds of crazy names and like dude you're seeing people coming in and just like smoking just gallons and <laughs> gallons and gallons of this shit like has to be detrimental to the fucking lungs i definitely think it is but Hey, uh, yeah, but we would make, we had like a baseline of flavors that we made and we sold them to shops and shops would just resell them. Um, I did that for a while and then, uh, and then basically I got involved in, um, I had a buddy who was making, had a bunch of extraction equipment. This was once again, a while ago before extraction was really big, um, and he was making uh, all volatile extraction. And so I went to him and I was like, hey, I've heard there's this terpene prop, terpenes. No one had sold terpenes at the time. The only other one that came at basically the same time was called uh, Blue River. You ever remember that? No. So Blue River came, they were out of Sacramento too, I'm pretty sure. But uh, I went to this guy and I was like, how do we get the terpene out like, and, and sell this? And he spent some time, I spent some money and helped him get some equipment. And then he was basically making all this, making terpenes for me. And then I started a company called Mr. Terps. And we were like the first big volume terpenes company selling. And what are these terps derived from? Cannabis originally. The beginning, it was all cannabis derived terps. So you have to find all these different strains to get all these different terps. You can't yeah. just load up on one right because there's only certain terps out of that yeah. specific strain yeah so at the very beginning um 
he was doing it all and basically he would just be like oh i have this much of this this much of this um and then i would take it and just market it and sell it on the website um and then with time we did all, all different we went to using botanical terps and re recreating terpene blends and selling them um that was like a six seven year span of doing this and what are um, the people what are these companies using these terps for that you're selling so at the beginning I think it was kind of almost like a fad, right? So what people were taking the terpenes for is they were taking them and like putting a little, like they would take like a, a little dab of oil and a little drop, put it like in the terp sauce. Like before we had terp sauce, they would put it in like the liquid and then they would take the dab and it would just be like flavor in your face, you know? Um, I saw people put it on joints, Got I mean, it. a million things. Um, I mean, I had one group from Fort Bragg that was... Uh, I'm not going to say their names, but they, there was a group out of Fort Bragg and this guy came to me and he's like, look, dude, he's like, we have like 25,000 pounds and the weed looks good. He goes, eh, it just doesn't smell good. He goes, so you think we could just spray it with terps and it would sell? And I was like, well, you have to find some way to like dilute it down and spray it um, because it's so potent, right? So I helped him come up with the little solution and uh, I made like this like uh, almost like inert spreading agent that like would basically burn off, like evaporate. And um, this dude sprayed like 25,000 pounds of weed with this, with turp blends to make it smell again, bagged that shit up and he said it was just flying off the shelves. Wow. Yeah. So that was a... Uh, a fun experiment but that's what he was using it for he just said the weed just didn't have the smell and no one wanted to buy it because you opened the bag and you got nothing well when you spray it with terps you get something for sure yeah. so the terpenes uh that was a long fun experience of learning about how that stuff works and things and uh, how are you labeling them and selling them at that point like because the terpene names are so fucking weird and you really don't, unless you're really educated, you don't know what that smell is, you know, so. We were doing strain names. Oh, okay. So we were we were basically just, we had like our core strains. Got it. And we would just sell the, Makes sense. the strain names. Um, Man, everybody must have been over that o back then, <laughs> that OG terp. Yeah, the OG terp, the pine, uh, like the piney smell and things, but. That went on for a long time, and then a bunch of companies came into the space. For the longest time, we were the biggest and the best. Uh, and then over the last five years, it uh, a bunch of big companies came in, and the whole use of botanical terps became just way more cost-effective. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, that was a fun experience. And then... Because then they started making synthetic terps. Yes. Right. So like the, what they are is like there's some companies that make good, I call them good versions of them. But basically what they're doing is they're recreating a pro terpene profile by using botanically derived terpenes from other plants. So you can like, uh, for instance, so you got a strain, right? You go send it away and get a terpene analysis. And it says th this is the quantities of, of you know, pinene, myrcene, you know, all the different numbers. So then you can go and get all those same terpenes botanically derived from other plants, and then you can recreate it at the same percentages. And theoretically, it right. should smell like that. Um, it's not from cannabis, but the companies that do the recreations and kind of follow that program, it's like the way we used to do it, um, they're pretty realistic. Um, the ones that are using like, like make stuff taste like bubble gum and shit, like, that's done, in my opinion. But um, if you can make it taste kind of like the strain and, and smell like the strain, I think there's there's a lot of use for that, you know, with uh, CBD pens and even yeah. THC pens and things and candies. Um, terpenes play a big part in how people feel for when sure. you use the when you use these products. So uh, we you know we had like a. We had at one point we were making like what we called the awake blend and then the uh, sleep blend. And all that was was we looked at like 50 strains 
that were more designed as indicas and we looked at the common terpenes and then 50 strains that were more designed as sativas and looked at the common terpenes and we kind of created these blends and that a lot of companies would buy that and use that to make similar stuff like they would make gummies and they'd be like energized gummies they were just using the awake blend terpene to put interesting in it. so interesting yeah, it, was, it was a fun experience so then where, where did that take you after that so then after that the next uh where were you when you were doing all that that was a combination of Florida. I lived between Florida and then uh, I moved to Spain. So that was when I was moving to Spain. So then I moved to Spain and in Spain I got involved in... in how did the whole Spain. move to Spain come up? Like how did that even opportunity so present itself? A buddy of mine, um, he basically had a seed company and uh, he was like, oh, you know, uh, I need help doing these different things. So uh, I went to, he's like, let's go to Spain. He's like, uh, I need help over there to do these things. And I think you'd be good at it because you have the ability to build these places and you know how to run like the ins and outs of business and things like that. So I ended up on a plane and I flew to Spain. And next thing you know, I spent four years of my life there. Um, one year really working, um, doing b basically bringing American genetics um, to the Spanish seed market, basically, is like the gist of what was being How was, done. What was that transition like when you first got there? Like, what was like your first week like in Spain? Like the experience, where in Spain were you? Was it challenging? Like, going to grocery stores and getting what you like what was that whole thing like so the first place <clears throat> that i lived like my first it was like first 45 days i didn't really have a home i was like staying in either a friend's house or um and the friends weren't there so i was like alone but um i was in san sebastian which is a t small town um that was a lot different because not everyone spoke English. Um, the people are kind of, they're way more yuppity and like upper class style people. Um, so that was a big experience of trying to like, you know, learn. What's their feelings on Americans? White or tan? There's a difference. How there's a, kind of, kind of there's a big difference. Um, Cause tan's more like the Spaniards, right? Well, no, no. So, so in, white's like the smash thumb going no, so into in, their territory. In San Sebastian, okay. In San Sebastian, um, it's Basque country. So they bass, like bass, fish. No Basque. Okay. It's uh, I'm like they must love the white man. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, it's a different kind of um, culture in like different type of people. I mean, I'm not really 100% verse on all the things, but but they're like the more upper class kind of uh San Sebastian as like the not uh was like the highest population of um Michelin star restaurants in the world for a long oh, time. Wow. Yeah. Like it's a uppity place. So going there, it was very uh different in the sense of the people there, they, they're really proud of their culture. They don't want to like speak English, right? But I only stayed there for a little bit. Then I moved to Barcelona and Barcelona was totally different. Barcelona, everybody speaks English, at really? least anyone that you have to deal with on a regular basis. So all the people that I had to deal with, the grocery store people, excuse me, the um, restaurants, uh, everyone spoke English. And the only time that I ever had a problem with not being able to get something done is like trying to call like the telephone company to get internet to your house. Oh, it's, a, it's a fucking nightmare because you call and it's all, every prompt is in Spanish. Right. I can't understand it. And you can't even get to where you can get to a person that potentially might speak English. There was no prompt. When I first moved there, there was no prompt like for English speakers, right. press one. You know, here in America, it's like it says for Spanish speakers, exactly. press two. There, there was no English prompt. By the time I left, there was an English prompt. Interesting. But when I got there, there wasn't. So that was the most difficult thing. Otherwise, it was pretty easy. Is the a lot of moke smoking in Spain? So yes, when I first when we when I first got there, um, 
cannabis was pretty prominent. Um, they hadn't yet passed the laws that basically said like, they came out with laws that basically kind of made it more legal. But the Spanish government's outlook on, let's say like criminal stuff is pretty good in the sense of like, if your neighbor is not bothered, they really don't care what you're doing. So if you wanna grow some weed in your house in Spain, um, just make sure you're not bothering the neighbor. If the neighbor calls and says, hey, Johnny's over here and he's got big weed plants in his backyard. Well, the police are going to come and they're going to take your weed plants and they're going to bother you. But otherwise, hey, no, no one's going to say nothing. You're good to go. And that's how the businesses were operating there. Is like most of the time somebody owned a whole building, landlord of the whole building. He basically wanted to build a little weed shop in the bottom. So he'd put a weed shop in the bottom. And then who's going to complain? All his tenants above. So you'd be like, you complain, you're gonna get kicked out. That's Got how they it. basically did it. So you what know, what do you mean by weed shop? Like a little dispensary. Dispensary. Yeah, they had really? dispensaries everywhere, no everywhere. Way. Weed everywhere. You could buy weed at uh, in every. Because I think we have spanibus coming up here in like the next week or something. Yeah, right? spanibus will be at the end of March or in the middle. It depends. But uh, spanibus was like my second trade show I ever did when I was there. Um, I mean, it's crazy. It's a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people. And, it's getting uh, a lot of traction in the U.S. Yeah, people like it. Well, if I think it's a place a lot of people can go. Like, it's like a touristic, it's a good experience, right? Everyone's been to, like, MJ BizCon. If you've been in the industry a long time, you've been to MJ BizCon, you've been to these. But, like... And those aren't even, like, smoking shows. Yeah. Over there, it's free for all. You can do whatever. Like, they don't really care. They say that you're not supposed to smoke or whatever, but, um, yeah, they don't care. They're much more relaxed over there, and you get. I mean, they have to be because like all of the seed banks, like kind of come from there. Like all of our rolling papers come from there. Like, it, I mean, I don't think we we talk about it enough. Like how monumental Spain has been in this whole culture of things. Yeah, I. I mean, I called Barcelona. Barcelona was the new Amsterdam when I was there. It was becoming that, and I think it's definitely there now for sure. I mean, they have insane amounts of dispensaries and shops and a lot of education based stuff like i'm pretty sure there's a college there that actually does cannabis degree now um wow. so they're, they're really open to it um are they producing fire like like super fire indoor and shit so when i was there people knew what they were doing there was definitely the people who knew nothing you get a lot of people who are just growing auto seeds on their balconies that's like the most common, right? Uh, just people buying little yeah. auto seeds, throwing in a couple pots and sticking them in their, on their balconies. And you can grow some decent stuff, especially for yourself. That's what a lot of people are doing. But then you had like the growers, like the people who are really putting money and time into it. And um, yeah, they were growing good weed. Good weed. Uh, they had a lot of, you know, different practices. They were like some of the first people I saw like doing like mass indoor soil grows wow like lots like of big plants or like sea of green style no like sea of green style but with soil they just like swore by only using and i don't mean like cocoa blend or anything i mean like pure soil ocean forest yeah but like having all your food in the soil system yeah having like ten thousand two two gallon soil pots in a room like giant Jeez. room with just soil pots everywhere you know it's like in hand and they hand feed that shit they hand feed it like you know, once every three days or two days or whatever yeah. it was. I had never seen like that massive scale. Magnitude. Yeah, they didn't, they like the, uh, they swore by it. They just said they produce better, better product. Um, but yeah, as the seed business there is the big business in Europe in general, um, because seeds were, seeds are kind of regulated differently. The, the seed is basically not illegal. Now, how do you obtain those seeds obviously you got to grow plants to get it so it's like kind of like an oxymoron type of thing they expect for you to get them out of nothing but selling seeds holding seeds excuse me totally allowed in, in spain yeah so the seed business is very big in most all of europe I'm sure it generates a tremendous amount of income and jobs and sales mm. tax and yeah. everything else as well oh yeah the way i love the way that the europeans do taxation because basically they have like what's called the VAT. 
So when you go into a store, right, like uh, if this bottle of water here is four euros, um, that bottle of water costs four euros. You leave the store, it's four euros, right? But you just paid like over there, it's like 22% tax, right? But that 22% built into the price, built into the price, same at the restaurants, no tips. You don't have to tip because when you get your meal, those prices are the door, walk out the door price, right? So you can calculate in your head real quick what your bills are going to be and things like that. And then when you buy stuff at stores, you're not like wondering what it's going to be. You already know that's the price. And the way they do that, though, is like they don't really tax income. They tax when you use your money. That's the way they look at it. So you have really high outgoing tax. Got it. Like VAT can be 33% in some European areas. So if it's, uh, if you make, you know, a hundred grand one year, right? You don't really pay much tax on it. It's like almost none. But what are you going to go do with that? You're going to spend that hundred grand most right. likely. And if you choose not to, well, then you, you're good. You're not, but one day you're gonna. Right. And then when you do, now you're going to get taxed 33%. So you're going to have 70 grand, which I kind of like the way that works. I wish a lot of other places did it that way. Maybe a smart system for us, especially yeah. how Americans are and yeah. everything else. Just fucking tax us and give us health care and everything yeah. else we need. Yeah. Oh, health care there was awesome. I paid 60 bucks a month and had like the most premium insurance you can imagine. I'd go to any wow. hospital. My friend that lived there, he got his wife got um his wife had has had two kids there now, but their first kid, I went to the hospital to see um he, I mean she had like a luxury suite in this hospital. It was like like a a Ritz Carlton room. Wow. It was beautiful. He had his own bed. He had like a queen bed that he got to sleep in and then she had like the hospital bed and then they brought in a, a, a crib for the baby and like they fed them like gourmet wow. and it was all like for 60 bucks a month worth fucking insurance. American slop here yeah. <laughs> get some free fucking pudding that's it <laughs> oh man Give me some kamad some powdered eggs yeah they they do it they definitely do things nice there um but yeah, I enjoyed uh, living there. Too. So you you went there specifically because of this br- this opportunity with a friend who, basically, he's running this massive breeding operation, yeah. right? Seed, yeah. Can you tell cool. us a little bit, like what what is a a breeding? I think it's often nobody really thinks about like these kind of things. You know, we're just all going along and. You see DNA genetics and you're like, oh, they make some seeds, but nobody really knows like how or what or what do these operations look like? Yeah, so the, there's, I've seen many different ways. So of course it's not always the same, but um, the way that we were going about it is we would build these very large, uh, let's call it like a grow room, very controlled, large environment. And then we would put- What are we talking about size, like a hundred by a hundred? Or larger um, even like big warehouses yeah so in we would take like a big warehouse like a twenty thousand square foot warehouse and we would build like uh it would be like i'm doing meters to yards so it'd be like 90 yeah not 90 feet long a box 90 so basically like 100 long by 30 so 100 by 30 like a 3,000 square foot insulated cooler shell and then in, they use cooler panels yeah we even? yes no. and yeah so actually I don't know how much of this I'm supposed to talk about, but so there was a a very big Hamon company, you know, like the the high end ham. Yes. Okay. So like uh, like, a, like like salted like aged ham. Yeah. Like, can you get the whole leg in oh, in yeah. Spain? It's a big deal. So there was this giant Hamon company, one of the biggest ones in in Spain, and um, when I got there, somebody told me they're like, "This is where you grow weed in these Hamon company warehouses." And I was like, this doesn't sound right. And they're, they're like, no, they, they own so much square footage and they just need to rent the space. So they'll rent it to anyone. And I'm like, this is fucking all. Like, right. we're, we're, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, and no, they were right. That's where everyone grew weed. So I found this Hamon company that was out there and they, uh, I rented this giant fucking space from them. And then they're like, you need weed rooms? The guy, and he's like, I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, draw on a piece of paper the size of the rooms you need in there, and uh, we'll give you a quote for insulated panels for it. Because they own the company that builds the, the insulated rooms because that's how they store the, the hamon. Wow. So they already had everything, right? Sorry, everything ready. Um, 
So in one of these, like their rooms are just all these legs of, yeah. of yeah. ham basically hanging and aging and yeah. salt and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So what they do is, uh, cause they, that's like prosciutto and everything else, right? Yes, basically. Yeah. Um, Which but yeah, they, fire. they build the same insulated room that we, they were building for us. They build those and then they, you know, run HVAC to it and they cure, cure the ham in them. Um, at a really cold temperature. No, at like a, I mean, it's not cold, but it, it's... Like 70 degrees or no, something, 65? it's like 60, 60. Okay. Yeah. You, Just the way we dry. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, very similar. You want it to be dry enough, and you want it to be cold enough that you're not going to get like crazy blooms of yeah. mold and things, but um, yeah, somewhere around that is how they would do it. But so they built, they would build us the insulated rooms and then we inside the rooms i would go in there and i would get grow tents like four by eight grow tents and um i would i had a specific company i used because they were like super sealed and then we would uh run hvac through and basically so we could isolate the pollen in every one got it ideally what we tried for the most of the time is one of those hundred by 30 spaces we would try to only cross pollinate like one or two different pollinators to keep things from blowing all around and yeah. cross contaminating yeah. but and we stuff. we would connect basically we would run duct work and so all the air going into that there was like you know a hundred tents in that one room all the air going into every tent had its own intake through a HEPA system and all the air going out of that tent blew through a HEPA system Got it. so everything was isolated um as best as we could and then there was like strict practices for the guys that were doing the reversals and things where they couldn't like they had to change their clothes if they were dealing with different pollen and things like that i mean that just seems like such a extensive amount of work having all these individual tents yeah. and how many plants were inside the tent so in a four by eight we would do like so a four by four 32 females would be inside a tent about 32 female plants and then you guys would have them hooked up to irrigation too um for the most part we would use like this spanish style where they they it was like a auto pot almost okay um but uh it was like basically yeah they would like wick water from the bottom got it it was like a shitty flood and drain style shitty flood and drain and then uh all of all the whole room would get hooked up to the same little like master reservoir and as far as like plant health, we didn't strive for plant health. Yeah, it didn't matter. Yeah, we needed to keep them happy, but it wasn't like we were trying to. And you almost like correct me if I'm wrong, but like breeding and whatnot, like it it's almost better if it's not perfect, right? Because like you want to make sure that you're you're making seeds that will be stable under not the greatest conditions. Is that true at all? Like, is there any truth to that? Like stressing plants out to make like. Well, no, I think. I think what you're getting at is more of like along the way of selection. Got okay? it. But um, no, we would basically, um, we just we would just keep them happy enough, uh, but we weren't like, you know, we weren't trying to grow like bud. Yeah. So it's not like you're trying to make big blooms or anything. For sure. So yeah, we would do that. Then, you know, we weren't really involved in the selection side of it. There was a whole nother division of the company that all they did was test, select, and then they would basically come and say, hey, look, here's the cutting that we want to use as the female, and then here's the cutting we want to use as the pollinator. And then that then it took became our job to, Got it. to make it. So they're almost like pheno hunting what they want you to breed for for them, basically. And at a huge scale. Like they're I mean, I mean what does harvest look like? Like when for the like seed? when when a hundred of these tents are ready to come out and like the shucking process and like just all that. I mean, that must've been just crazy. So we actually had a really good machine that you just used Cause basically you gotta think like all you're doing is we would stick it in this, like almost like a mulcher kind of machine. And what it would do is it would like strip everything and all the seeds would fall out and then go into this little tray Got and then it, it kind of separated it. So then you would have like seeds and shake in Got a big it. tray. And then we had another machine that was like a vibrator kind of machine and like Got it. and it would vibrate similar how you used to do it yep. to get the seeds out of your, you know, brickweed. Same concept, but when on a huge scale. And um 
Yeah, and then you get all your beans, and and then you could do some visual sorting. I mean, we're talking <laughs> tens, tens of, of thousands, millions, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, millions of beans, and then you sort. Um, you do sometimes you do a visual sort. Nowadays, they have even better equipment. Like after the beans would leave us and go to the other step of the process, they would use these visual, like these laser sorting machines that could. They would look at the beans and basically say. You know, they could go, through, uh, beans would be on like a conveyor and it was like just instantly rejecting the beans that were bad. It would, it would dump them off the conveyor. It was wow. like a crazy machine. But, um, and then it would sort them into like 12 packs or 13 packs or whatever the fuck it, you're doing. Then there's another machine after that where they would, they would like, uh, it would count, count the beans and then they'd put it in different types of packaging and things. Cause this company wasn't just making their own brand. They made, a shitload of brands that existed at the, uh, at the time. It's really interesting. There's so much readily available online and, and we show all this stuff that we do and how we build things and grow with things. And like, you don't really see this process documented anywhere. Mm. Like they keep it pretty mm. hush hush. Yeah. I don't think they like uh, people knowing all Is that about... just because you think it might be like a little more on the uglier side? And it's just mass production and they don't want you to think like all the billions of beans or what do you think the secrecy is behind like the the breeding so like here in america you know it's the breeding industry i think is really becoming more of a thing right now through our time where like the europeans have been doing this for a long time right yeah. and i think they wanted to keep it that way for a long time they thought they were going to be able to kind of maybe hold that back where now there's a lot of u.s companies starting to put time and effort into it um but these big european companies they've had not just time to figure it out oh for sure they've had insane amounts of money and to experience. figure it out so much experience to a whole nother level of like like the, we were talking about it yesterday, the strain hunters guys. Yep. Like that stuff is some of the coolest things. Like at the same time, you go and you see that, and like a lot, of, I guess a lot of the new new age guys are like it's the most shitty looking weed ever. But that's what actually makes the good weed. It's a, right. somewhere it comes from there, right? So uh, I think they've tried to hide that from mass mass people because they went and spent all the time to do it in the years and years. They don't want to get knocked off. Yeah, and. Uh, I mean, they've done a lot of like stuff, like hardcore stuff that takes a lot of risk to be yeah. willing to do. And uh, yeah, like going in the jungles of like South Africa and like that stuff's scary. Like, I mean, there's like, there's bad people. Just to get pollen and shit? Yeah. To find stuff and then getting- That's all it, land race stuff, yeah, like, right? Getting all the old school land race. And then now what they're doing is they're taking all that old land race stuff. They're using DNA-, DNA uh, sequencing and then they're able to take that and say like hey look we have like the original Durban right and then get like 20 new strains that are on the market DNA sequence them and figure out which one really has this in it so now you can like go backwards and say like all these you know lemon cherry gelato this this and this it actually has this much of this land race that's in South Africa so it's pretty cool, but that's what these companies are doing now. I know they're spending a lot of money to figure out which ones really have which, because then they can go and say like, they can figure out what are these land races, how to create new new stuff. What's the advantage of like the land races? Because a lot of these hazes and different shit we see g grows for like incredible long periods of time, very unattractive, yeah. s nose isn't great. So how do we... How do we use the these land race strains that started all of this, like in the current culture, in industry? So what I th I, th I think the way that they're trying to to look at it is, um, so if you are trying to make something, like if you're trying to make something a little more like. Uh, funky like hazy you want you're trying to add that effect into a breeding program you already have kind of worked through and you've learned you can start taking some of that new age stuff and using the old land race stuff and kind of sequencing that in to the new stuff i think that's what a lot of companies might be looking into doing um, got it is kind of taking little pieces of it because you can with a good breeding program, you can bring in specific traits and bring out specific traits that you're looking for. 
Um, oh, from different phenos and different yeah. stuff. Yeah, and it, I mean, if you take like an old land race haze and a new school um, can gelato, n- number 33 or something gelato, and you do a pollination across of it, it's not going to like be 100% either way. You're going right. to get tiny little effects to change, right? Depends. And then you have 10,000 beans, right? You got to go through those 10,000 right. beans. It's a lot. It's a lot, a lot of work. It's it takes, a lot to process. takes a long time. They, about like the good stuff that they were making was anywhere between four to six years of research before they produced something new they wanted to do, like really produce something new. It took wow. four to six years. So that's a lot of work. That's insane yeah. to think about. And then they had stuff that had been backlogged for years and years and years. Like once they do the research, it's not like they put it into production right away. They'll wait to see how the market is and things. So it's a wow. lot of work. A lot, a lot of work. So you're in you're in uh, Spain and you're doing this the breeding thing. Yeah. And I mean, at that point, you're getting really used to like the lifestyle and the culture and mm-hmm. living with them. And what is what are some of your most m- memorable um times in spain well at the beginning it was just like learning about everything that was really impactful to me and in traveling around um when i first got there i went on like the whole like the big european cannabis uh convention circuit so i went to prague and uh austria and uh in france and all over basically so that was a lot of fun and i was with a bunch of people a lot uh, mainly americans so that was cool it was like having like a group there to do all this you know um and then one of my favorite places period uh is called andorra most people don't know about this place but it's a little country on the top of spain um and it's uh it's like a tax shelter country. <laughs> That's what it's really known for. Um, anybody like, any, like tactical surviving? Like no, that? no, like tax abate, like tax shelter. Evasion, got yeah. it. It's like a, one of those weird countries, you know. But it's a beautiful place, and so it's, it's in like the mountains. All, all the outlaws, all the people there. who have all, big companies too. If you have like big companies, will go and park their assets there got to it. avoid Spanish Heavily taxation. Heavily taxation. Yeah. Um, but it's a beautiful country. It's pretty much really tiny, and it's pretty much a big mountain range that goes through it. It separates France and Spain, basically. Got it. So going there was awesome. It's about a three-hour drive. And then the other fun part in Spain that most people don't know, you can uh, – they don't pull you over on the highway for speeding. It's like doesn't exist. So I used to Sounds rent – like Detroit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like they, they don't – they do not – no one's going in a, a, a chase you. No one even – like cops don't just pull people over. Like they'll have checkpoints, but yeah. like there's no like cop on the side of the road with the radar. No. So when I figured that out, I would rent really nice cars in Barcelona. And like the first time I went up to Andorra, someone was like, oh, it's going to take four hours to get there. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I rented like a – I don't know, like a – a five series BMW, you know, and that, like the the bigger engine one. I got there in like two hours and like 20 minutes. I was doing like bailing that thing out. It was like 120 miles per hour for like two hours on the highway. Wow. Like just not stopping. Just flying just by flying. other motorists? Yeah, yeah, just flying. And you, other people are flying too. It's what's cool. Like you'll get a guy to come up on a motorcycle and just passes you. You're like, what the fuck? And you're doing 120. Yeah, and I'm doing like 120. Going 120 for like two hours is really cool. Is this considered like the Autobahn or that's different? Autobahn is totally different. But they just don't pull you over. And... I was like, what are they going to do? I did get speeding tickets sent in the mail. To really? the, they would get sent to the rental car company. But you wouldn't get pulled over? Or you don't get pulled over. No, you, they would get up? sent to the rental car company. And then like a year later, the rental car company would, would like send me a bill and be like, oh, you owe like 260 euros for that trip to, to Andorra. You got, you got clocked. Because they do it with airplane. Wow. So I would get those tickets and I would just pay them though. How often would those tickets come in? I mean, probably like... I don't know. Out of five trips, one time I got hit. Wow. Yeah. So it was. It wasn't. Uh, it so wasn't that, that means bad. like, if you're a smuggler and you're dipping one twenty, you got the green light. You got the green light, man. <laughs> you not. You don't. You get checkpoints though. There is checkpoint. Got it. One of the first times when I was there, 
I had a, a friend that was there, lived there, American. He wanted, uh, he was buying clones from some like Spanish guy and he had to drive like two hours to go get these clones. And he got like, I don't know, like 2,000 clones. He's got like wow. 2,000 little clones in boxes in the back of this like Peugeot, you know, like tiny little fucking car. And I'm with him. And uh, we're driving back to, and we get to a fucking checkpoint. And like the checkpoints is like, it's like, they're just like, look, they basically scan your registration. It's like the same thing we drive through here when you go from state to state. Kind of like they they just check your registration because the little sticker on your car it tells you if you have if they scan it it basically says good to go or bad to go. Got it. And so, uh, but we're like freaking out. He knows he lived there longer than me. He knows that that's all they're gonna do is like scan that little thing. But I'm like, dude, there's like we're going to jail. You know, we're gonna go to jail tonight if we get. And I'm like, I don't want to go to no Spain jail. You know. No. Um, and yeah, and they just scanned our shit and looked at us and they're like go ahead but it was that was definitely a wake-up call uh that there is those checkpoints all the time but yeah once again they're not looking for they don't want problems it's what just did, an easy way what did the clones look like back then did they come in like little rock wool like 50 50 to a slab kind of so, situation over there oasis okay yeah. oasis is really big there for propagation they, you it. see a lot more of the oasis than you see uh rock wool or or rapid rooters. Yeah. Rapid rooters, I've seen more like smaller people maybe try to use them and things. But like anyone that was like volume, Oasis slabs. They Got would use it. The, and then they use like the Oasis slabs they use. I don't forget. It's like uh, you get like 180 sites in a standard slab. So they're, so they're like the minis? The mini. It's the tiniest little root thing. But that's how they would do it. They would just stick all these. As soon as you get a tiny bit of roots, they would take that and put that in a little pot. I never mastered the Oasis. I tried it a few times, and it was just really hard to judge dry back and when to water and yeah. all that kind of shit. They're, they, they had, that's the main way I saw any kind of like mass. Because Oasis is used heavily in flower production and yeah. all kinds of shit like that in the flower yeah. industry. It has really good air to water right. ratio. Uh, very good air to water ratio. Right. Um, but yeah, that's how they would do it there. Badass. Yeah. And so what prompted, like when it was time to move on, like was it just the contract and the situation was coming to an end? Everything had finalized? What You accomplished what you needed to? Accomplished what I needed to. And um, at that point, I wanted... Uh, you get tired eventually of foreign countries, at yeah. least for me. Um, I lived in Japan too. So I lived in Japan and Thailand. Both of those were like a year max kind of deal where Spain had been almost, five, it was like almost five years, four years at that time. I just wanted to go back to get CeCe's Pizza and McDonald's. Like they have McDonald's, but like I wanted shitty restaurants. Was the McDonald's better there than it is here? Or is it pretty much the same? Because you hear that sometimes that like in Japan, like they have high-end McDonald's where the, fo the, the food at McDonald's is better than what we're accustomed to. Yeah, in Japan they do have better better things in spain no like it was pretty similar um when they got a taco bell that was like that was great for me i was really happy when taco bell showed up in barcelona because I mean, they didn't have one close to mexican food <laughs> you're gonna get right yeah like that was that was that was a big deal but um yeah the time i it, i wanted to go home basically i wanted to go back and then at the time i'm like where am i gonna move um i can live anywhere i wanted in United States, basically, because that's where I wanted to come. I was like, do I go back to Miami? Do I go to Las Vegas? Um, do I go to California? And I was like, you know what? I want to go try Dallas, where I grew up. Um, because I just remember I loved all these specific things about it. So I moved back to Dallas. And um, when I got back to Dallas, I wasn't really working or caring to work at the time i was kind of just really good in my ways had some different businesses on the side and stuff and then uh one of my buddies that was out there's like man i got a big grow in oklahoma right over the border and i'm like 
okay, that's that's cool. And he's like, I know, you know, you know a lot about this stuff and things. And I'm like, yeah, I know a lot about this. I'm like, okay, well, let's go check it out. You know, he's like, it's the baddest ass thing you've ever seen. You know, this guy's like 50 years old. So he's like super pumped on his setup. Yeah. yeah. Was uh, it legal? Was it had its medical thing then? Yes, yeah, it was already medical. Um, so he had how, all, how long ago was this? Five, seven years ago? No, this was like uh, four years ago. Okay. Yeah, four years ago. So he was right at the beginning. And he's like, yeah, it was, uh, you know, just talking it up. You know, I got I got those bulbs that, you know, are real bright and things. You know, it's like a Texas he guy. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, but no, he's no. doing it. So I get out there and he has like 36 double-ended 1000s in like a giant barn, basically, with uh, compressed gravel on the floor. Uh, not even like concrete floor or anything. You can AC systems, like window units just cut. Like, I mean, he probably had 40 window units Holy in the bar, you know, it was just, and he was so proud of this place. And, um, yeah, I was like, oh, wow. I was like, this is, this is crazy. He's so like, you're we're growing, pulling. You're growing outdoor, <laughs> indoor. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, man, we, we pulled a, you know, what did he say? It's first time. He's like, oh, we got 25 pounds out of this thing last last run. You know, he's got the Numbers 30. were probably good too, right? <laughs> he's got 36 lights in there. He's pulling 25 pounds and he's proud. Yeah. You know, uh, the weed actually looked really good. That was, I was impressed by that when I first saw it. Um, and I'm like, dude, this is just horrible i'm like i'm like i don't know how you're gonna make this into anything he's like it works and i'm like okay. well sh sure enough i convinced him into i was like you got to make some serious changes um and it's gonna cost you a shitload of money <laughs> but he he comes from another li line of work where he had money got um it. and uh yeah i uh started just helping him giving him pointers and things to do and and whatnot and then as i'm doing that my girlfriend is like, we got to build a facility out here. Oh, she was pushing for yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. She's like, this is the, this is, you've done this your whole life. This is, you, you're really good at it. You know how to do everything um, and look into it. So I started looking into it. And what I realized is it reminded me a lot of like the old days in California where like you could just build anything like kind of wild west. Do you even need permits out there? So in where we are, so when we were, when we, I would try to go like the more appropriate pro proper route. So I go to the building department for the county of where we are and I go in there and I'm like, look, this is what we're going to build. And I had like a building plan and all this. And I think they're going to like question everything. And the guy goes, go down, well, all the way down right here and uh, go see Bobby Lee at the floodplain division. He'll give you a little permit. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what did you just say? You know, go see Bobby Lee. I go down the hallway and I go to see Bobby Lee and Bobby Lee's like, $13, sir. Build whatever you want. And I'm what? like, what do you mean build whatever I want? He's like, you want to build a skyscraper? He goes, make sure it doesn't fall on your neighbor. He goes, build a skyscraper. He goes, we don't care. It's $13. And all the permit does is say that they, whether you're in, we do a survey and we tell you whether you're in a floodplain or you're not in a floodplain. It's thirteen dollars. Have fun. Build whatever you want. What the? Fuck? I was like, okay. So paid him his thirteen bucks. And this is why there's a story of like people shit just blowing down the road and yeah. fences collapsing oh, yeah, yeah. and all yeah, this. Yeah. So no building department. But I went and did as best as I could. You know, I I went back to the guy down the hall, the guy who actually understood uh, what I was trying to do. And I'm like, no, look, like this is not going to be some bullshit. Like I'm not trying to build like a little shit. I'm trying to build like a monster facility, like a commercial grade thing. And he's like, okay. He's like, Why are you well, here? if you need me for something, I'll help you. But he's like, you're go, go do it. So, uh, yeah. So, so it's real. Like, I mean, you, that's not everywhere though. In okay. the, in the rural areas, it's County based. So based on what you just said, and you don't want this fucking thing. Like obviously you're built, you're investing millions would you then have to go like find the person to like check the compaction of your ground and d like just figure all this shit on your own to make sure that it was going to be okay? Because if there's no building department to hold you to certain standards, you could have your fucking foundation cracking and shit moving. Like, how do you avoid all that? So, 
I taught myself real quick how to do all this stuff. That's what I did. So the first step was, um, like, uh, step one was obviously land surveying. Yeah. Well, I I literally looked at we got it. We got the land, and I looked at the land, and I just quickly said this is where it's going to go, you know? And I wanted it up front by the road because I'm not scared. I didn't want to have to go hide it in yeah. the back. I didn't want to have to build a road back there and have people have to go back there. So I put it right up front. And um, I did learn very quickly, I shouldn't have put it there <laughs> um, because we had to raise the ground a little bit because it was it was like one of the lowest points of the property. So Where it, you wanted to put this, the yeah. housing structure? So luckily I and was- you found that out through surveying? Through that $13 permit? I found it out from a good hillbilly boy that's lived there his whole life, came out there to start digging, and he got down real low with the toothpick, took it out, and was like, it gonna flood here, boy. That's basically what he said. Really? Yeah, he like knew instantly. He's like, he's go, we're gonna have to raise this real high. He's like, if we go back a little bit, it'll be better. Then after he told me that, I went and got a laser myself. I got like a survey little thing. I rented it for like, you know, the week from a company and I started shooting it all with lasers and I realized he was right. Good old fucking country boy was right. And, uh, but I still wanted to put it there. So then it was now, how much is it going to cost to build this up to where I need it to when be? When you're talking about building it up, you're talking about adding dirt, compacting it, yep. and then your slab gravel, then your slab on top of that yep. to just make sure. Cause what is this flood zone? Just heavy rains that it's just, they get crazy. Yeah, so when you have torrential like, downpours, in when you the have area like a forty-acre pasture that's been used for years for just grass farming, basically, you know the the water runs to a common spot usually, Got right? It. And so that it was kind of the the place was kind of in the path of where that water wants to run to get to where it kind of just drains Got away, it. right? Goes to the road, and the road has like the trenches, right? So um, I basically went to. I got the guy back there and I said, look, I know where I want to put it now. And I know about how, how, how much it needs to go. So I said, look, I want to build a pond. So dig me a pond, big ass pond and all the dirt that comes out of that pond, use it to build the pad. Got it. So that's, that was the step one. And we were already going to build a pond. The pond was going to cost like, I don't know, $10,000 to dig. And then uh, I gave the guy like, maybe 15,000 to, instead of just taking the dirt out and building a berm, he took the dirt out and he spread it. So, Got it. And made this giant pad. So basically like a two acre pad is what he built. He built this big two acre pad and got it up higher. Then, uh, then I brought in a contractors that I knew very well from that area. It was a guy that I knew from that area and they built the, the first metal building structure, like the first actual commercial building. Um, and they knew they're, already, they're good with the ground. So I kind of learned from them how to do that area, of how to pour concrete in that area and things, because I watched them the whole process. So then once they had accomplished that and built that building for me, their original was like um, 5,000 square foot space. Um, then... I prepared to pour the slab for the rest of the 30,000 square feet. And I poured that pretty much with my own guys. Um, my Yeah, pretty much all by myself. But before we did that, the way you build these giant greenhouses, for the most part, the way that we like to do it is we poured, we made eight foot deep by four foot round holes in the ground on all the major columns that were going to go vertical. So there was um, 175 of those holes, huge holes, eight yeah. feet deep, four foot wide. And we filled those completely with concrete and rebar. Because these the ground's fairly soft, yes. right? Yeah. So that was... And good, so the, rich soil? Yes. Really good soil. Really good uh, soil in that area. It's sandy, but good sandy. So um, it's easy to drill. Very you, easy to drill. But you have to build rebar cages and yeah. all yeah. kinds of shit to go in that hole. Yeah. So we built all these big basically anchors and then so that that's where all your columns your you know are going to go for the greenhouse and then once you pour all once you have all that done then you can actually start erecting the greenhouse and then at the end you come in and you basically pour your slab at the end that's the way we Got like to it. do it 
So we actually erect the whole metal structure. And then you pour the slab around all that stuff. Yeah, right up to it. So, exactly. So we have our, you know, circle pylon, you can call yep. it, right? And those are all set at grade. Yep. And then at the end, then basically we even put the poly on the walls, on most of the walls, like the polyfilm, right? Oh, really? The panels. And then we use that as your form. Got it. So now you can pour your concrete and it right goes up right it. up to the right up to the form. Um, so you don't even have to have forms really if you if you don't want. It's a very easy, cost effective way to pour a very big slab. Because you basically already have your your forms. And then you're just floating the whole inside and leveling you just float and shit, it. Right? Yeah. yeah, I got ten, I think that so we poured thirty thousand square feet with uh, a pump truck operator, like a boom truck. And there was two guys on that, and then I had fourteen hardworking guys out there. Um, I swear, one of the kids was twelve years old. But and they they had concrete experience. They, no, no, the... they were they were professional. Con Got it. They were concrete guys, but they were like I'm saying, one of the kids was twelve, probably. But he was like one of the hardest working ones. Yeah. And it was twelve of his them. His daddy, his grandpa, his great grandpa been been pouring concrete in Oklahoma for uh, yeah. hundred years. Yeah. So there was twelve of them. And me, and I more of a supervised it all and made sure everyone was getting things the way we wanted and going back and checking. But we poured that whole slab in one day, 30,000 wow. square feet. Um, and then we- and what is that, a four inch thick slab? So we pour about, for the most part, it's four inches. We try to go with four inches. Sometimes it goes, you know, three because yeah. the dirt's not perfect and whatever. But um, Did you have no, to put gravel down before you poured the concrete? We did not put gravel underneath it. Um, and we did not put rebar in it. So I poured something called a monolithic slab. And the way that we do this is we use this mesh. It's like a polypropylene fibers, right? They, it's like similar to like how you would make carbon fiber or, or like uh, fiberglass, fiberglass, right? So you, it's that. And so uh, they use it like construction uh, DOT uses it when they're building like the sides of the roads, not the main road, but the sides of the roads, they'll use it because they don't have to put rebar in it. Yeah, And they'll put like a... Uh, They'll put one pound per yard in the concrete of these fiber meshes things. Um, I put 10 pounds per yard because it's cheap. It's like six bucks extra. So why not? The, yeah, so I put 10 pounds per yard and uh, yeah, got a 30,000 square foot slab that... Because the only thing you're bolting to it are your benches, benches. pretty much. Yeah. Like you're not doing crazy fucking car lifts and all this no. other shit. Yeah. And if if little crack, it's not a big deal. Putting rebar in there would have been another big expense, sixty, eighty grand, uh, probably in materials and maybe even another on labor. Um, you just don't need it, not for this, yeah. um, not for a giant green. Because all your all your trusses are all supported under yeah. posts that are eight yeah. feet in the ground with rebar yeah. and all that other stuff. Yeah. So yeah, everything's strong. It's basically just to have a nice floor. So where did this? Like, where did this greenhouse come from? How did you pick the company? How did you end up picking the size? Okay. Like, where did that plan, that cultivation plan come from to decide how big this was going to be and, you know, what it was going to be? So... Because this is kind of earlier before, like... I mean, I guess this is right at the time where, like, these greenhouse companies are emerging and they're all fighting for marketability and, and shares in the industry? You know, how did you end up picking what you went with and why? So the original plan was I w was going to use a Chinese manufacturer that I had done a lot of research with that was very, very skilled in manufacturing giant gutter connects. I did a lot of research. And I these are primarily seen in japan they're with, seen all over the world actually really? mainly a lot of it goes to russia wow they build a lot of them in russia in china there's shitloads of them but they're a legit manufacturing company so they were they were the original people who were going to build me whatever i wanted and i spent a lot of time figuring out the design and what i wanted and like finally what it came down to was if i used the basically i got a price from the chinese company to get it here and all the equipment um, I mean, God, shipping that massive structure. Oh, it was going to be, it, no, it was going to be uh, 30 to 40 foot containers. Wow. Filled. High cubes. 30 to 40 foot versions. So once it, I got a number for it all to be done, I was like, okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go shop these American guys and see if any of them can get me close to this number. Because if they can, 
I'll take the American guys, right? right? Um, and I found a company, uh, which was called Grossman. I'm not shouting them out because there was a lot of problems with them. Uh, this but, was the Chinese company? No, Grossman was the American. Farm okay. Tech. This, Got it. It's their division of Farm Tech. So they basically came Aren't they in, like the largest greenhouse there, There's bigger. Builder? Th- there is bigger. Like Atlas is bigger. Got it. Um, GNC is bigger. Um, there's some big boys out there. But so Grossman came in with a good bid, very similar price. Like we're talking maybe like... Ten uh, percent higher than the but Chinese. But this is a manu- American manufacturer. American manufactured using a lot of Canadian steel, Got so it. good, better, so to say. Um, and yeah, then they manufactured it all, all the all the equipment, all the pieces. We went and did a tour of another couple of their facilities in Colorado, places that people had bought from them. And I learned along the way different things I wanted to change and make better, um, the different fans, the different types of wet walls, all this stuff. So we bought all the, got all the equipment, and um, then that came, and that was like eight semi trucks, eighteen wheelers stacked. To it, it uh, whenever it what was. What are you like, removing this with, like a grade all, basically? To take it off the all, trucks. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, forklifts. It would be like when With the off road ones, a great all style. Yeah, like yeah, the big it, tires. Exactly. And shit. Four day. It would be like uh, four trucks would come one day, and it would take all day to unload. forklifts to unload. Yeah, all day. That's all they did all day was unload and then stage the material. Unload and stage the material. It was a lot of a lot of a lot of work. Um, but yeah. So then after, so that's how we came up with that, and then the design was my design just based off of things I had saw. Yeah. One of the big. Um, like people I had followed was Dave from Preferred. Um, and at the time he had like more of the hoops, yeah, the nice hoops. Um, but I knew he had he, he was building those other ones. This was at that time about two you know two and a half years ago. Um, and so I, I basically was like, I want to recreate this. That was it. I just want to make it more my style and and right. put all my engineering into it. Um, I wanted one giant place. I didn't want different places, different rooms. I wanted one just where you can walk from one side of the facility to the other and not have to get touched by rain. That was like one of the big uh, things for me is you walk in the front door of this building and you don't have to walk out all day. Yeah. And that's kind of how we designed it. Um, yeah. And then... Along that, what was the installation process like? Like, how did you find the people to like help you build this? Like, what was that screening process like? And <laughs> how did you find the people in this rural area to do this work with you? So originally, we hired an, a company that was going to help do it, and like a construction company yeah. from Oklahoma. Uh, they were a national got it. company um, who focused on, on greenhouse greenhouse building. Yeah, and they uh, were horrible. Um, they fucked up, broken shit. It was just a nightmare after nightmare after. They said they could do something and they they couldn't. No, but luckily you had me because I learned all the. I knew the shit that was broken before they even would admit it was broken because I'm looking at the drawings and the plans and I'm like, this is not right. This is not right. So, I started getting in there with my guys, guys that I had, and we were trying to go back and fix a lot of the shit that they were doing wrong. Um. And we did. And then eventually um, I was working with, uh, so I had all Ritter control, like Ritter makes the blackouts, the interior curtains, curtain systems. So I had all Ritter stuff. And so I got friendly with one of the guys who worked for Ritter. And I, uh, I asked him, I said, hey, do you know somebody around here that can help me finish this building? Because... My guys are horrible. And uh, he connected me with this guy. It was like just a good old Mexican guy from Texas. But he was very, very versed in greenhouse installation. Massive, like Texas A&M greenhouses and things. He was like a, a, he had like a little working crew. And he would like work for the big builders. Like R&L is a big builder. Got it. But he had his own little crew. He'd be subcontracted. Yeah. And so 
I got with him and then this guy came and saved the day. He came in there with his crew and these guys like, you know, they were, they didn't really speak English, but one guy would. And between me and him, I would help him figure stuff out that he didn't really understand, like the complexity of things and maybe how to, how to seal things better and how to build these things better. But those guys were hard workers and they never gave up and they fixed all the problems, uh, at least most of them. And, uh, we got it built. And then wow. that was the start. Because once you have this beautiful building. That's just the beginning. <laughs> then you got to go inside the building and uh, outfit it with all the equipment. And, and then all your electrical. All the electrical. Um, so are you using like the like the quarter inch poly um, sidewalls or are you using like tarp material? No, no. It's, it's all 5 16th got it. panels. So on our... On, What's this lifespan on those panels? Is it like 10 or 20 years or something? Yeah, so... The, um, so we use black, white, they're called black and whites. Those are on all the way around up yep. until the ridge height, the gutter height, and our gutter height's 14 feet. So it's black and white all around. The lifespan on like those on the walls are like 20 years. Got okay. It. Um, the roof, which is the clear ones, those, you know, like 20 years. But what really happens is after about five years, they become very brittle. So if stuff starts to hit it, they'll It'll start shatter. It, they'll start to crack and things. If you got to go do work and maintenance up there, You're trying and, to walk up there, yeah. It, they, when they're new, you can walk all day long on them, no problem. But uh, once they go through a couple seasons of hot and cold, they get brittle. Um, a big company, like ag companies, they'll try to reglaze the roofs every ten to twenty years. They'll take What's all that the panels. process. They just take you take off all the panels and you put all new panels back on the roof. Got it. Yeah, I mean it's a lot of work and it costs the panels cost a fuck ton of money, um, but that's what they do. Like a big like commercial, twenty years, 10, 20 years, they start thinking about how are we going to redo the roof. So, um, and then there's better panels now than twenty years ago. Right. Like they better at diffusing the light. Right. And it makes the the canopy inside much more uniform. Why why do they do the black and white all the way around 14 feet? Like doesn't like as the sun's rising or setting, like doesn't you can't utilize any of that light? So you can. So when Because if you hit let's say at 14 feet, like maybe 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that sun's going to start but I mean you got DEs so it doesn't really matter, right? Yes. Yeah, so you got it when you're building and designing these places, you have to think about like when you're building something so big, right? Is you you're gonna there's gonna things that you could make better, right? Um, but is the is there is the positive outweigh the negative, right? And so, for instance, for the walls, right? So if you put clear walls on this whole greenhouse, your your curtain, your blackout system is going to have to turn and Got come it. down, okay? And that turn in the blackout. It's where it breaks. Right. Yeah. And you're getting into U joints and U -joints drive suck. lines and all exactly. kinds of fucking shit like it's that. It's a nightmare to deal with that, right? I have not one. I have a, a the hundred... radiuses are are much more problematic when they start getting into the bends and the curves and over time and binding and yeah. So I opted like, to build it differently so that I have only one, your top. Yes, one curtain that goes across. And so there's no bends, nothing. I even redesigned the grow, uh, grow span drawing because they wanted to put every at every gutter connect, they wanted the material to come up and then go back down around the posts. And I redesigned it so it just became continuous because I didn't even want that little bend. Right. So it's, it's just a problem. It's, it's a place that you can have air. So could I get a little more light from the sides? Of course. Like my um, greenhouse is like on the edges, there's like one two there's like three fucking bends and it's like this perfect bend has to fit into this puzzle piece exactly perfectly one bind trips the motor bends fucking this yeah. next thing you know the whole thing is fucking snap crackle popping yeah. yeah it's bad so i i was trying to remove as much problems for the long term um because that that curtain opens and closes every day and it's never going to stop. Multiple times a day. Yeah, or, yeah. It, for us, it opens in the morning and then closes in the evening. Yeah, so twice. Yeah, twice a day. And uh, they're designed to do that, but the more parts that can be broken, yeah. And so then the way we control, like, the lights, all the we have the DEs in there, and um, that's all connected on a grow link system, and we have different sensors throughout the whole facility. But, but our lighting... Um, 
the lights inside the big gutter connect, they run off of the data they're getting for their zone. So the lights in Bay 5, if, if uh, the PPFD drops below a certain amount, then the lights will start to come on. In Just Bay, in that zone. In Bay 5, yep. And in Bay 4, they react to that. But the temperature of the whole facility, they aggregate all the sensor data together. Got it. But the lighting does not use aggregated data. Interesting. The, the lighting only uses, because uh, like Bay, our Bay 5. Well, again, when the sun's moving and shit, one might be lit up more. You don't want to burn all this extra energy. You don't have to. In the winter, Bay 5's lights are on every day, all day. But one, two, three, rarely do they come on. Four comes on a little bit more. But five is just in a dead, the, the, the sun barely hits it in the winter. How many amps did you need for that setup? So the whole place, we have we have four 2,000 amp transformers. So 8,000 amps. Jesus. Um, but one of them's a redundant, so really it's about 6,000 amps. Um, yeah, about 6,000 amps. What's a power bill like that in Oklahoma? 12 grand. Jesus, that's it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's 12, what, no, it's 15, 12 to 15, 12 to 15, I don't even know. God. I don't, I don't, I don't pay the bills. <laughs> 12 to 15, like 20 lights here. Um, it's about 20 grand at its worst. 20 grand at the yeah. peak? Yeah, and, and yeah. yeah, so cer certain times it will get up to be a lot higher than others. But propane That's bill. That's like a 72 light facility in California. Yeah, yeah. It's insane. <laughs> propane bill is really high in the winter i bet and those things just burn fucking those heaters burn like nothing dude you can literally watch your gauge <laughs> moving yeah, as yeah. those propane yeah. burners well, fire like uh in a like the winter months there we're gonna spend 10 grand to keep that place hot and all i'm trying to heat is so I'm trying to keep my daytime temp above 65. Right. If it that if if the lights and the temperature outside. You're basically trying to stay out of that dew point zone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's it. So I'm not trying to keep it hot in there or anything. Right. Um. But yeah, like when it gets because when it gets real cold. Um. And I also use the heaters also as a way to dehumidify. Right. Because it burns all the moisture in the air. Yeah. I heat the room up and then I burp it out. Um. But. Uh. Yeah, the heat bill is a big one. In there. But then in the summer, there's zero, you know? So it aggregates out to be maybe like you're spending like uh, $1,500 a month on gas but or like $2,000 a month on gas because there's only a couple months that you're paying a lot and then the rest of the year, you don't even use gas. You know, only our water heaters use yeah. gas besides that. We don't, and then uh, we don't use propane generators for CO2. We use all uh, compressed. Have, wh how... What's your thoughts and, and your experience on using this gas when fans are pulling the air out of the greenhouse so much? Like we're seeing, you know, you utilize it. We've seen um, David utilize it a little bit. What's the advantage? Have you figured out the advantage of like how, what the advantage is possibly versus just removing all of this CO2 out every time these houses burp? Yeah, so... I think there should, there, with time, we'll learn a lot more about it. But for the most part, you know, when we have good weather, that greenhouse doesn't really open much um, when we have good weather. Obviously, in the summer, can, it, the CO2 never comes on. So, obviously, the CO2 is running only when the No fans, ridge vent? Yeah, no, not, no ridge vent. If there's any vents on, CO2 system's off. But also, the way I designed it is I can take that whole you know, 30,000 square feet of gutter connect and I can get it from 400 to we're only, we only like to shoot for like 850 in there. Right. Okay? I can get it from 400 to 850 in like two minutes. I mean, I have a, I have like a, a one inch copper line coming from the massive tank out there and I run it at, at 250 PSI coming into the building and then I break it down there. So it's like, it's a fucking firestorm. Yeah, yeah, moving. Yeah, so we put so much CO2 in there so quick that I can bring the levels up really high, really quick, right, to where we want it to be. And then even if it only sits in there for, you know, an hour before the uh, an exhaust goes on, and then the exhaust goes on for 10 minutes, and then boom, we get another hour, I think it's worth it.
um, in the summer, it just doesn't. So that's come on. basically that's a, a it's a sealed greenhouse application. Besides yeah. your vents in the front and your wet wall, you're not fucking with the sides or the roof vent or any yeah, of that. We have ridge vents too. So the way we do it is we have three sources of exhaust. We have what's called the ridge, which will bring air will open up an intake on the other side of the ridge, and then it will exhaust and basically suck out the hot Just air. Just the hair, yeah. hot air above the so curtain. So that's step one. Right? Yeah. Once we reach a certain set point, that system turns on. And then that give, it, the controller gives that about five minutes or so if it can meet a requirement. If it doesn't meet the requirement, then the exhaust fan, one in every bay, will come on. Got it. If that doesn't, then the second exhaust fan in every bay will come on. And then, so you basically have like four cooling zones. Exactly, four levels of cooling. Your first is the ridge. Yep. Your second is the exhaust fan. Yep. Your third is the wet wall, and then your fourth is your second exhaust fan. Basically. Exactly. Yep. And uh, that allows because sometimes you don't need it all. Sometimes right. you do. Um, but with time, we the plan is we're gonna I'm gonna HVAC the whole thing. Uh, but I wanted to see how well this worked for a whole year. That was really it. I so it's to... worth investing the money into all that HVAC than to just let it run the way it is? Like your I think your bottom line is going to increase that much to make the whole process worth it? I think the answer is yes, especially with time, right? Because you build the system, put an HVAC system in there. Um, excuse me. It'll, um, it's not like it's going to break. I right. mean, it'll last a long time. Um, so you will, with time, you will get it back. But the problems with it is, is so in the summer, you just get your THC quality, your THC degrades ho horribly because it's too hot and there's no way to combat that. Um, the wet walls just won't do it. I right. mean, um, you, you can, you still get good looking weed and you get a lot of it in the summer, like shit loads, but the THC numbers are just low because it's getting blasted. Diminishes. All the time. Yeah, your nighttime temps are one of the big problems. You know, heat diminishes everything. Yeah, you got ninety degree nighttime temps. Ninety degree nighttime temps, like that's hot. Um, that's a couple days, but I think yeah, putting the HVAC in there basically now makes it so you're just you got you can have perfect temperature all year. You know, all year long, and you le you still have all your your fan systems in there. You're not I'm not going to remove any of that. That's just going to be an emergency system, basically. The wet walls and all that. That's if the HVAC goes down, we still can cool the place within right. reason. Um, that's the long that's the long term plan. Um, I already have it all designed and ready to go. And we have the power there, which is beautiful. So it's not it's not as hard as just a matter of building it it's a matter of building it pouring some big concrete pads for the big outdoor units and basically putting like we're basically put uh like 60 ton units on every bay of the gutter connect so you get about 60 tons per bay none of this is water like water cooled like we see some of these systems like i've gone and toured some indoor facilities where they're using like fucking massive water towers and stuff to do all their cooling in these big big flower rooms so those the, basically so when you get into these very large hvac systems you get you you start to they call them chillers instead yeah. of yeah so what they're using so like traditional hvac stuff we're using r410 or yeah. r22 to move the coolant right when you get into these big systems they use water instead um it's not as a, as efficient as gas, but it's way cheaper in large scale because right. gas is very expensive. Like you know, you see one of those little Freon tanks, right? Dude, they're insane here right in now. California. I bet you seven hundred bucks or something. God, there. so that's think crazy. about filling up massive lines that run four hundred feet and through a whole building. You you might have two hundred thousand dollars in Freon, right? Wow. So. And you have to refill that at yeah. some point. When, if it has a leak, yeah. And if you get a leak and that shit comes out overnight, it's like $200,000 worth of gas just went in the, went up in the air. So when you use chiller-based systems, they are much more you know, forgiving. Um, and that's what you've probably seen at places. I know yeah. in Colorado, a place that I've uh, been to and seen, they use a massive um, chiller. Yeah. So it's the same thing as a traditional AC, like a split system, but instead of having a Freon line, you it's have got a, water. a big water line. Um, but the systems that I would put there wouldn't be, they would be self-contained package units. So it would be 
a unit that would just sit on the outside of the greenhouse and then it would have an intake and an exhaust system going in. So it would suck in the hot air and then put cold, cool air back in. And that would be a gas-based system. I wouldn't need chiller lines for that Got because it. you're not running any far distance. But let's say you wanted to do the same thing, but you would put one big chiller on the property and then run a chiller line down the whole greenhouse and have different units off it that then you would want to use a chiller. Got it. yeah so my system's different the way i would go about it so there's been a lot of talk about like the oklahoma market and how they just how it was kind of like a free-for-all and we'd hear the story of the fucking you know the the, the asian tribes coming in and, and building massive fucking yeah. <laughs> greenhouse facilities and all this stuff so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they've put a moratorium on cultivation licenses. Yes, in Oklahoma, so yeah. new people can't come in. You're you're now you're either in the system yeah. or you're fish out of water. Yeah, two years moratorium. Um, Wait, so they're going to allow more to come in in two years if anybody it, <laughs> has the balls to do it? At least two years is what they're saying. Um, you can you you can potentially take over someone else's license. That, Got it. But no new licenses for two years. And then March 7th is the recreational vote. So if the Which rec- is huge because right now it's just medical. Yeah. And we've seen just based on experience with these other states, when things go wreck, a lot more people are interested in trying and exploring things and who weren't willing to just go through the medical system and get their, their medical card before. Yeah. And what it really is, like, the big thing is you got to look at, like, surrounding states. And Dallas is one of the biggest metroplexes in the United States. And a lot of people are probably going to want to go to Oklahoma. and Because it's not too far away, right? Like, yeah, whoever, whoever has the dispensaries right on the fucking border are going to probably be putting up some pretty big numbers. Yeah, huge numbers. Did you see Missouri? What happened in Missouri? No. So Missouri went... The 2022 medical in Missouri, $560,000 a day average sale volume for the whole state of medical cannabis. The first week, they had a blended average of $6 million a day. So they went 10x multiple wow. going wreck. And that's Missouri. Like Oklahoma, get with the Texas influence, I think we'll see. And I think Tex, uh, Oklahoma's doing something like over... Two million dollars a day, three, four, five million in medical sales right now. So if you can get like a ten x on that, they're going to be like you know fifty million dollars a day in cannabis right. sales. Yeah, um, we're already seeing like right now, even like right before like this this trip, um, all like that outdoor junk is a lot of that's kind of going away on the market. It's a lot of it's been sold now. People are starting to look for weed again, like in the market, in the medical market there, where like for the last couple months there's been a lot of massive outdoor greenhouse crops coming in and the market was really flooded where now we're seeing a little more want and demand nice Um, but obviously the way we our our approach is just we produce the same product all year long theoretically right so another interesting thing about your cultivation style is you have perpetual harvesting where every bay is is it a week apart from the bay two two weeks weeks. So you got five bays and you run, everything goes two weeks after each other. So, so you're harvesting every two weeks. Yes, basically. Sometimes you have some strains, like part of that is working through those strains and figuring right. out, right? And some strains in the summer finish quicker than in the winter. Um, but for the most part, we're filling a new bay every two weeks. So it, it needs to be out of there before then. So. With with your extensive history and breeding and, and doing this project in Spain and, and now to cultivating in a market that's about to become wreck and like how do you decide what strains that you're growing and, and how do you pick these flavors and, you know, especially with a process like yours that is going so fast and perpetual harvesting, it's like kind of like once you get something into rotation, you it's in rotation. It's a hard, it's a hard move to replace yeah. Things like how are you picking the strains that you're deciding to grow and whatnot? So first thing we do is a lot of tests. So we will take a strain that once we know like, oh, we like this, right? Like we'll grow a small amount. We'll do a test. Once we know that, then we put it through like the ringer. Like we put it, we put plants on different bays of the greenhouse, see how they react, right? Like trying to 
now we're going through like the stress test, right? Um, I have like a little, you know, uh, makeshift setup, the indoor setup that we have there, like it's a tent. And uh, I'll take a, I'll take strains and put them in there and I'll set the exhaust fan to 95 degrees. So I'll just run them all flowering at 95. I'll run it at 100 in there. And I'll try to mimic what the greenhouse is going to do to it. So I can see the reactions, right? And then based off the reactions, like sometimes, you know, you'll find out like this guy can survive 100 degrees. It doesn't really come out bad. Other ones, they like are, you know, half dead. They can't, they just can't do it. And um, a lot of the stuff that we initially started with, all those genetics, those went through almost two years. While the whole time we were building, I had a little setup out there that I was doing pheno hunts and testing and really doing these stress tests, really trying to figure out what's going to work in this building. But until you put it in there, you really don't know. Um, you don't. So once we have something that we think is going to be good, then we start running like, you know, nine plants on a table of this. Got it. Where the other, you know, 180 plants are not. Um, that's kind of how we figure out which ones work and which ones don't. <laughs> what are your What are your favorite strains you're cultivating right now? Like your top two. Um, oof. So, in my opinion, one of them is called mangoes, um, which that's basically like a. It's like a. It just smells like mangoes. It's an OG cross, basically, an older cross. But the the Fino came out, and it was very mango-y. Like, it's like grapefruit. You know, remember, like, the old strain grapefruit? Yeah. This is basically that. Yeah. But it has, like, a straight mango flavor yeah. to it? So it smells. It's euphoric, you know, mango f- in God, your face. God, it must be so amazing, like, a, a live resin of that, that would, would be so crazy. That would probably be real good. One, of the, one of the best like live resins I've ever got was from Alex from Miami mango. He gave me some mango haze. Okay. Oh my God. It just, it fucking smelled like pureed, like exotic mango. And I'll never forget just how amazing, like I was just like had it up in my nostril, just like 24 seven. I had this Z Skittles cross that we made. We took Z Skittles and we did all this weird stuff to it. it took a long time, but, and, um, we, we, called it zookeeper but it was awesome in all my testing and then when we filled a fucking you know three thousand square foot bay full of it um it was a nightmare it was basically a waste of money (laughs) really so performed in its little yeah fucking nine plant in the bay but then loading the bay yeah it comes out fluffy it won't it it does not like when it gets beat up that was like the mango like the from what i've seen of the mango haze like you don't want to grow that for flour but like concentrates. Yeah. You know, that's so that's what we did with it all. It, in this D Skittle one, we called it zookeeper. It smells so good. And like, even just like taking your finger and running it on it, you get this euphoric, like tangy kind of smell off it. Yeah. That would be great for resin, but production was horrible. So that was a lesson learned. We learned that that one doesn't work. Um, and then another strain that I really like, um, would be like, uh, one that we call the cowboy um which is basically like um it's a cross of uh it's like some of my mike exotics but with, oh, exotics yeah exotic, exotic genetics yeah yep. it's like a mix it's a cross of some of his stuff i took some of his stuff and we made Dope. made our own version of I've it. I've heard he's a crazy breeder like of all kinds of fucking animals and plants and like not just cannabis like he like really embraces just breeding everything that's cool guy it's, yeah. it's science and isn't he up in like oregon or washington or something i think he's in one of those yeah yeah he's, so he's i know he's like not a, california he's a big he's on a big farm with all kinds of fucking animals and yeah. shit so yeah that would probably be um and then one that that i i was involved with excuse me that i really like is um a, we call it cali red ak and it's basically a cherry AK uh, pheno that we found. It was like an old school AK-47 that smelled like cherries. Wow. And then we crossed that with the uh, uh, Three Kings headband cross. Nice. And that cher- uh, Cali Red AK I really like. Um, it's really good for big commercial production. Like it just grows rock hard nugs everywhere. 
mildew mold no none of that goes on bugs don't even like it another big thing is like learning like some strains bugs just love oh for sure um and then you'll have other ones right next to it and they don't want to touch that plant touch it mangoes bugs don't touch it um we had a strain called gusano and the bugs just would flock to it like every bug it's almost in best the, to have a few of those randomly around, you know, yeah, to try yeah. to track everything. Yeah. The, the whole, the, like literally every bug in the greenhouse would just be on the gusano and everything else would have none on it. It was just, it was very odd, but that's some things you learn too. You learn which ones to do and which ones you don't. Um, so when you have this perpetual harvesting, what does like an IPM look like? You're only hitting like certain bays, right? And then. Yes. Yeah, so the way we do it first is we, um, like, so the way that the bays are, you know, usually most of the time your finished stuff and then the one that's the, so basically like these two bays are not going to get sprayed. Right. So basically you're spraying this part of the greenhouse. Um, and then we, when we spray, we spray with the fans on. Got it. So that you're, you're not getting the, anything lingering in the greenhouse. So we turn on. It's moving right yes, away. And we, uh, we use like a direct hydra sprayer and we just beat right What's on. What's a hydra plant. sprayer? Like a, like a dram hydra. The big bad boy. B- yeah, that big thing. So we have, a, it's like a 50 gallon res and uh, we got a like 200 foot hose so we can go all the way down the bays and we get underneath all the plants and things. So like th- that's basically how we do it. Um, and that's how we avoid that but we've never had any problems with testing or anything with this technique um, awesome you're not we're not ever spraying directly on that that stuff but it's definitely potentially in the air but for sure um yeah no no real problems with that uh and then like the only other thing with the perpetual that you got to kind of like battle is like co2 right so yeah. when we are using co2 uh you got to weigh like is it do you want to have co2 for the four bays that need it or do you want to cut off the CO2 to the one bay that needs it? So you have to, that's once again, making a decision. And our decision is run it at like 850. And that one bay that wants to finish, sometimes they don't want to finish. Right. We're okay with that because the other four bays are going to get much bigger plants and much higher yields if we leave it on. So it's with the perpetual and the large facilities, you got to kind of weigh it. Ideally, if you, if you have different rooms, you wouldn't have to worry about it. But this way you do. Wow. Well, and then how about any any kind of crazy weather shit out in Oklahoma? Oh, yeah, so they get the um, those 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 poly hoops guys. You know, like they're not meant for Oklahoma. Let me tell you that you need real greenhouses. Because <laughs> really, those like when you roll up your sides, it's a fucking parachute. It's a parachute. Um, and I've even seen really nice ones. You know, like re- there's really good ones out there. Um, but. Yeah, like uh, the wind will catch it, and then it's just flying, and it, it takes everything with it. I've seen where some guys thought it was a great idea to build a, you know, hundred foot long, eight foot tall uh, plywood wall to break the wind, and then that wall caught, broke off the freaking post, the post, 
went into the greenhouse and now you have you know a 300 foot poly tarp with a hundred foot worth of poly, uh, plywood in it just blowing down it's like a freaking anvil anything it got in its way it was just destroying you know and that's like 95 mile per hour winds when that that specific moment was like 90 mile per hour winds out there so it's like, pretty brutal out there yeah it can it's you know, it's, it's rare, but when it happens, it happens. The other day we had, uh, I think they said in our exact zone, um, I can look on my weather thing too, but it was like we had like uh, 65 steady for all night, but then we were getting like 100 mile per hour gust and the greenhouse, our greenhouse, fine. You don't get nothing. They're designed to flex. Right. That's the thing. Like you don't weld anything, you know, all the, that's why like when you're building these massive greenhouses, if you look, there's very little weld joints, if any. You really don't want weld joints. You want bolted joints, right? God, because so they can, can pivot slight, very slightly. A yeah. little bit of pivot's okay, and the plastic can swing, and right. that greenhouse gets moving, and the wind kind of gives it a little shift, but then when the wind goes back, it goes back. Where if you had like a, a very rigid thing, a weld snaps, and then now you lose your integrity in the... Brutal. Yeah, so you, you, it definitely happens um, and, and whatnot, but... Yeah, we're trying to figure out the new things to try out there, and um, we're really trying to push a lot of this stuff that we see when we come to California, um, like the little the uh, jeters, the mini jeters, and things. Like I, I don't see that. Just there. new, new things on the market, like new, new products that yeah. get people to interact and yeah. pick it up and purchase it and stuff yeah. like that. Try to bring that, and get it going, and bring it out there. Um, the big doinks you know i've been uh, trying to push that but i don't got anybody you can roll them that's the yeah, problem like i try but i can't do it i mean um, then when you're talking rolling a thousand of them yes you know. yeah you got to have a guy on just salary just yeah. sitting there rolling doinks right but um trying to bring some of that stuff there and see you know if the market likes it or not but like we've really pushed the pre-packaging which no one does it's deli style there still you know like how it used to be in california it's deli where you go in and you just kind of point and then they, yep. I want that bud there, that one right there, that Let me bud. see that jar. Yeah, let me see that jar and things. So we really have been pushing, which legislation is trying to get that to happen too. But uh, we just ourselves as a company have been like, no, we want to prepackage everything and we want to sell it cost effective too. We sell a right. very cost effective problem. We're not, we're not trying to sell $50 eights right. or $40 eights even. We're trying to sell 20, $25, $20 prepackaged eights. Retail. Aids retail yeah um that's what we believe like our products worth and in should way that i think a lot of people should be selling their product in the market over there because people want cheap stuff you go to these dispensaries oh my gosh and you hear like these guys have like uh like they're like you go in and you're like what's your best selling product and then they point to this wall and it's just like gallon ziploc bag filled with which like i don't even call it shake and trim it's not even that it's like fucking leaves the whole gallon bag and, and it's like 50 bucks they sell it Damn. for it. and people love it like a lot of shops i've been in and people are like obsessed with it they can't keep that in like, what are you smoking at that point it's just so much plant material yes. it's yeah. like what's yeah. the point i don't know but the people love it there they roll it up mix it with tobacco and just country it you know just country boy it just they, they just, just need something smoking they just need something smoking exactly. they just need to be burning yeah. something and yeah. going through the motion yeah exactly so you see stuff like that and then you're like and then you see in the same thing somebody trying to sell a 60 dollars glass jar eighth oh they're actually out there Th trying to do it there is there is some companies that are and it's just like most people buy the gallon bag for 50. <laughs> you don't even know what's in that gallon bag it's yeah. probably like four ounces it's like right. a qp so no one's buying that. Like, right. Yeah, maybe if that jar was 30, maybe people would. And I've seen that, like $30 prepackaged. That's kind of like the higher tier of... In, like the indoor, like yeah. the high-end indoor? It would be like an, be an indoor product for... So if an, a top tier indoor product's 30, they're going to be selling to the dispensary for 15 or 12.50, yeah. something yeah, like that. Exactly, yeah. And that's kind of how we go. We want, we, we, our product, our prepackaged eighth, we're trying to be like 15 to 20 retail, right? We don't use a jar. We use like a craft paper, really nice bag. Um, but that's the market that we, we think. We think more people want that. We've seen that more people want that than the higher end tiers. Right. Because it's too expensive for them, a lot of people. And a lot of these people are like... I mean, that's a luxury to spend $50 on an eighth that you yeah. might 
blow and fucking couple joints. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, no, very. You know? uh, it's a lot of you know, a lot of money, especially for certain people like that are. There's a lot of people in Oklahoma that are on like government, not let's say like welfare, but like structurized income. Yeah, so, assistance. Assistance. Yep. Yeah. So they they want to get high, and they should be able to get high um, with good shit, but. You don't need to spend 30 or 50 or 60 right. to get high. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the, our approach with the sales side of things and like how we try to... Well, rec should help with a lot of that. Well, rec, I think, will change everything, in my opinion. I think it's going to be uh, it's gonna be like night and day as far as like, you know... We'll, sales and stuff like that. And then we'll it's just to move. going and vying for the shelf space or wall space or things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I think it will uh, make a huge difference. Have you made any friends out there or uh, met any other cultivators or pretty much stuck to yourself? I like to stick to myself. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, I've built some facilities, helped other people build facilities at the very beginning. Um, I did a couple of, of builds uh, for some other people and um, I met those people, but really... I like to stick to my myself. I don't like going to the conventions or anything like that. It's just not my my thing. It's uh, I try to just kind of stay in, in my my lane. If I want to learn something, I, I look online. Right. And if I want to talk to people, like I have talked to a lot of people in the social club chat. I like that. I'm on there a lot, you know. And I'm always trying. Comfortable. To, it's yeah. easy. You know, I like like minded people. people. You yeah. know, it, it's a easier way to help people that. You know, because if you just put yourself out there, like there's just so much, you right. know what I mean? Like it's just so many people and 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 all these different arrays of levels, you know, and it's and it's challenging to be at a certain level, you know, and get asked very rudimentary questions. You know, it's like yeah. no offense, but like this isn't this isn't what moves me yeah. you know what i mean so oh, yeah. you get you get all types of questions um i was in another like telegram group with a bunch of uh grow people and uh yeah i just tried to help everyone i you know, i got a lot of stupid questions you know um but yeah i got i, I like that i like that i don't like the physically meeting people For and sure. things, but like doing like online and like how you do the patreon and things like i've thought about that takes a lot of work. It does. A lot of work. And uh, I don't know if I want to do all that work. That's why. No, uh, for sure. I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, like, the number one passion is gardening, being in the plant, not having to answer things, not having to do things. So, yeah, everything we do is work. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like how much how much time is left when you look at your, your pizza and you've got these slices doing all these other things. Like how much more can you take on? How much more can you devote to other things and – it's important to be selfish. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's important to do what you want to do. We only get this time, you know, on this earth one time. And so it's important to be selfish with that and, and do what you want to do with it. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for being selfish. <laughs> I get yelled at about that one sometimes. But I, I it is. It's, you, don't, you got one life. Live it. For exactly. A long time ago, there was a T-shirt I found at some random like store, and it said DoCal on it, defend defending our one chance at life. And I've stuck with that with that motto for a long time because you only got one go. For sure, that's it. So do it. And if you're not happy, you can never make anybody else happy. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you're you got to be first. You got to be first, right? Um, maybe when you have children or something like that, maybe right. that that can step down a little bit. But until then. You're always number one. Have to be. Uh, or else you're just never going to get anything done. Yeah. yeah. Well, Michael, thanks a lot for coming and coming into town and hanging out with me and Owen and taking the time out of your busy schedule. What you guys are doing out there and what you built is is awesome. Um, super stoked to have you here. And thanks for everything that you do as far as giving back, helping people, and you know everything you've created. You A lot of times people don't realize like when we – do these projects and create this stuff like we're creating jobs and creating opportunity mm -hmm. and creating chances for people and it's like you know certain people are going to take those chances and run with them you know and so yeah of course thanks again for everything you and brooke have done in the space and in oklahoma and we're super stoked to see how rec 
um, helps with the brand and, and what you guys do next. We're watching. Awesome. We'll appreciate it. And, uh, don't you have a video coming out here pretty soon too? Yeah, we have a video. It'll go live soon, hopefully. Uh, Got to do a little last minute edit on it, but then it'll be good to Dope. go. Yeah, it's like ten minutes. It's sick. Very well what do you, done. Where are you gonna drop that? Like on YouTube or YouTube. something? It'll go on YouTube. Yeah, it'll go on YouTube. And we've put a couple little ones on our uh, Instagram, like little clips from it. We got really cool time lapse of like you know filling a thousand we do 1100 plants in a bay but a Dumb. time lapse of filling and then a time lapse of harvesting sick you know people i don't think understand how much work it is but no. with efficiency how fast we can do it you know we can fill those that whole bay in you know two hours and we can harvest that whole bay in one day badass so we'll be sure to put those links on the bottom of this cool. podcast too and we'll put the links for uh, green bonnet farms and all your other information and um uh, Sounds I want to see good. that video. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, brother. I really appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you too.